Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Smithson Valley High School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Thank you for being with us very, very much. We appreciate your taking the time. This is a special occasion for 600 high school students at Smithson Valley. Um, I'm Brandon Wood, a senior here at Smithson Valley, and my question goes to both of you guys, and it is, um, did you ever dream or aspire to become astronauts? And also, what was the feeling when you figured out that you were going into space? Well, I'll start off and I'll let Samantha answer the, the second part. Uh, the first dream that I had when I was a little kid was to be an astronaut. The first book I ever read was about the Apollo program and flying and especially space was something I was interested in uh, since I was a, just a, a kindergartner. So I was, I was pretty lucky to be able to pursue that. And uh, the time you find out that you're gonna get selected to be an astronaut is different than when you get assigned to a flight. And those are different feelings. And I'll let Samantha talk about that. Yes, hello, and thanks for the question. Yes, I have also dreamt of becoming an astronaut since I was a little girl. And so when I finally was selected to become an astronaut, you know, f for me, it was a dream come true. And of course, I realized, and I, I was aware of the fact that you know it, it was a, a goal that I had achieved, but it was also the start of a new journey. And so I started training, I did basic training, and then I didn't know how long it would take until I actually got to go to space. Sometimes it takes many years, and it took a few years in my case as well, but not too many, so I'm, I'm happy about that. And when you finally get assigned, you know, it's like finally you're, you're almost touching this dream in your hands. You know that there is still a lot of work ahead, but you are on a path, and if everything goes well, then you will actually fulfill that, that big dream and, and, and get to space. And actually arriving in space, of course, has been everything that I dreamt of and probably the happiest day of my life. Thank you. Hello, my name's Cole Vazone. I have a few questions for both of y'all. My first question is how long does this whole process take? The second one is what are the dangers of this job? And the third one is what made you want to do this? Well, the process of becoming an astronaut is a long one. It starts when you're a little kid in, in school, uh, going through middle school, high school, uh, college, and then even after that, there's, there's always some type of training or learning or studying that it seems like you go through. But when it came time to apply to be an astronaut, the application process was about a year and a half. It, it took a long time. Uh, there was a pretty involved interview process that we went down to Houston. I went to Houston and Samantha did that in Europe and they interview you to, to find out what kind of person you are and they do a lot of medical tests. So just getting picked to be an astronaut is a long process. Uh, and then that basic astronaut training takes about a year and a half, two years to learn all the basic skills that you need to do spacewalks and to learn Russian language and learn about the space station systems. In my case, I became an astronaut a long time ago and I learned how to fly the space shuttle as a pilot. Uh, in the future, there'll be other vehicles that we learn how to fly. And then after that, you go through a waiting process to get assigned. Uh, which, which really just depends on how many flight assignments there are and how many astronauts there are, and you get in line and you wait your turn. And once you get assigned, Samantha and I were assigned together for about two and a half years before we flew. So there's a lot to learn. It's a very complicated space station. It's about a million pounds, and so there's a lot of stuff to learn. And, uh, but like I said, it's really a lifelong process more than it is um, just one, you know, checking the box and, and getting, uh, getting a degree here or there or anything like that. And um, as far as the dangers of this uh, job are concerned, um, you know, on a day-to-day on a -day basis where you are on the ground, I do not think that it's a, a very dangerous job. Um, Terry and I were both in the military before this, uh, flying jets, and I, I do think that on a day-to-day -day basis that is uh, more dangerous. Um, however, you know, the, the day comes where you, you know, you, you climb up a rocket and you're, you know, you sit on the top of this rocket and uh, there is hundreds of tons of... Uh, um, propellant that is about to ignite and uh, chemically propellants and explosives are very very similar <laughs> and in a way a rocket that starts and launches into space is nothing else than a very controlled explosion or 
let's not call it explosion, it's a deflagration, but it's really a controlled combustion. And, and so, you know, when you sit on the top of that rocket, that kind of goes through your mind a little bit. And uh, that's probably the most dangerous part of, of, of the job, the launch, uh, together with the reentry, you know, coming back to Earth. All of that energy that you have acquired through the rocket that have gotten you into space and have made you acquire all the speed that we have, we travel at about 27,000 kilometers per hour. And, and Tara's going to tell you the miles per hour. Uh, uh, all of that energy, you somehow have to dissipate it when you come back to Earth. And that, of course, is, is, is quite dangerous as well. So those are probably the, most, the two most dangerous moments, uh, the beginning and the end of a mission. And then there are some health risks, of course, um, con you know, related to being exposed to a certain level of radiation or just the effect that microgravity has on your body. It kind of um, gets your body, all the systems of your body, a little bit out of balance. Um, but I think we have those dangers pretty much under control, at least uh, when it comes to being here in low Earth orbit. But it's going to be a whole new challenge when we uh, start getting beyond low Earth orbit and explore further. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Celine Rendon, and I'm a senior. What do the scientific experiments in biology biology or human physiology consists of, and what information is being gathered that can be explored in space but not on Earth? Thanks. That's a great question. There's a lot of biology and human physiology experiments that we do. It seems like it's probably the, we do all different types of science up here, physics, material science, biology, but biology is probably our, our biggest and most important thing that we're doing. Um, a lot of the, what we do is on our own bodies. We do ultrasounds on our brain, our hearts, and our eyes. Uh, we have a machine called an OCT machine that scans the inner structure of your eye with a laser. Uh, we have uh, other ca specialized cameras, infrared cameras and stuff that we use to look at our eyes. And so we do a lot of uh, investigation on how the body reacts to weightlessness, and that helps us understand how we can live in space uh, and stay healthy and, and for even longer periods of time. We do some other experiments, plant experiments. Samantha was doing something called ANISO this morning, uh, which is a Japanese plant experiment to help us learn the fundamental uh, biology behind how plants work on Earth and also help us understand how plants could work in weightlessness and grow. Eventually, in the long term, if we're going to live in space for a long time, we're going to need to be able to grow plants here. We did a really cool experiment a few months ago when our last cargo ship was here. Uh, in the European Columbus module, it had a big pink light, so the whole station was glowing pink at night. It was kind of neat to see these plants grow, just like a greenhouse at home that has a uh, light on it. I did an experiment a few months ago that involved um, salmonella and uh, some other diseases that we were infecting, these poor little worms, these C. elegans worms that are commonly used in science, and we were studying how uh, they reacted to this infection in space, which their reaction is actually stronger in space, so there's lots of different uh, things that we're doing for biology, and it's very interesting. Some of these you just can't do on Earth because of the weightlessness that we have here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caroline, and I'm a junior. My question is for Ms. Cristoforetti. Um, what obstacles did you face wanting to be a female astronaut since the space program is mostly a male-populated program? Also, how does it feel not being able to go hiking or scuba diving? Hello, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I, since I was a little girl growing up, uh, I never really looked at life expecting that it would be more difficult for me because I was a girl. I, I always grew up assuming that it was an even playing field and, and I never thought that uh, somebody was out to get me because I was a girl or that somebody wanted to make things harder. Um, and I, looking back now that, you know, I have lived a little bit of my life, actually quite a bit, I'm 38 years old now, um, I think that, uh, you know, I had the right expectations. Um, I, 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 I don't think that, uh, you know, anybody was out there to make life harder for me. Um, I have chosen difficult paths, and so, of course, there have been challenges, and, uh, you know, at times it has been hard. But, uh, you know, you face those challenges as, as an individual, you know, with, 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 you know, with what you bring to life in terms of your talents and your ambitions and uh, your skills and your motivation. 
and uh, and really it, you know you shouldn't expect it to be harder or full of hurdles just because you know you're you're a girl or, or you're going to be a young woman soon so uh, please do not have those kinds of expectations i encourage you to think that you know life is full of opportunities for you just like your you know your your uh, male colleagues and just go and get them thank you Hi, my name is Mackenzie Beckwith, and my question is for Terry. Um, how do you use the restroom? <laughs> Very carefully. No, um, one of the most important one of the most important pieces of space technology we have is our toilet, and uh, the most important component in there is a fan. It 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 uses airflow or ventilation to compensate for the lack of gravity and that airflow is very important to make sure everything goes in the correct direction and doesn't come back in the other direction so we have a hose and uh, basically a big can and in both of those things like i said they have the airflow and you use them just like you would on earth and uh, that airflow keeps everything in the right place and it's very important and when it breaks uh, we're very interested in getting it repaired as quickly as possible so that's a big we kind of joke about it and everybody always asks that question but when we start going to the moon and Mars and, and living in the solar system away from Earth, having a bathroom that works and, and is able to be repaired very easily is going to be really important. That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Carlos. I'm a junior, and this question is for Samantha. Can you do a flip? <laughs> She's the expert. Doing a flip is easy. Stopping at the right time is the hard part. <laughs> right, thank you. Hi, my name is Antonia, and my question is for Terry. How, if at all, and to what extent do language barriers hinder operations aboard the space station? Thanks, Antonio. That's a very good question because, as you know, it's the International Space Station, and we have Samantha, who's Italian. Uh, we have a couple of Americans here, myself and Scott Kelly, and we have three Russians here. And everybody has different levels of language ability, but we're all able to speak each other's language, except none of us can speak Italian. But Samantha speaks everybody's language, so that's okay. Um, I could say if I could say pizza and a few words in in, in Italian. Tiramisu, yeah. So, but that that is something that we have to spend a lot of time preparing for before flight to learn Russian because we launched uh, in a Russian Soyuz spacecraft, and a lot of the comm that we do over there is in the Russian language. So, um, the ability to learn languages, I think, is an important skill for astronauts in in today's world uh, as we carry out these international mi missions. Uh, Colonel Birch and Captain Cristo Ferretti, thank you both for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. We appreciate your knowledge and expertise as well. And uh, safe travels while you're at the space station, and may you have a safe trip back to Earth as well. And we'd like to all give you a round of applause for all you do for being a real hero. Thanks, guys. This was a lot of fun, and uh, this is just a this is a fun part of our day. You had some great questions, and hopefully, we'll see you back in Texas here in a few months. Uh, thanks again, and goodbye. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, Station. This is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. The event. Thank you. Thank you, Smith. Smithson Valley High School and Representative Lamar Smith Station. Please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio communications. <laughs>